Hi, this is the first half of the much delayed part six of my sequence on stochastic processes. It's about the response of dynamic systems to noise, and in the development of the variance equation in the second half, it also provides some of the background to the analog Kalman filter. It's a bit sumsy with a couple of integration tricks and a tiny bit of matrix algebra. A very brief review of the topics covered in previous clips from the series leads on to an introduction to transfer function methods, while the second half continues via the Wiener process to the main business of state space analysis and the variance equation. Starting then with the whistle stop recap of noise processes and their statistics. Noise is said to be stationary if its statistics don't change with time, in which case we can take measurements along the time scale of a signal to find its average or mean value, for example. But this doesn't work for non-stationary processes whose statistics do change with time, and the only way to find a statistic like the mean is to take an average of many different samples of the process at the same time instant. I'm assuming our noise signals can be characterized by the first order statistics of their mean or expected value and their strength or variance, where variance is defined as the expected value of the squares of the signal departures from the mean. As well as by the second order statistics of correlation, covariance and power spectral density. This slide emphasizes the principle of correlation as a measure of the similarity between two stochastic signals, x and y, as the average of the multiplication of the signals at different time instants, t1 and t2. Or in the case of autocorrelation, how similar a signal is to itself shifted along the time axis. For stationary signals, correlations are functions of the time shift tor only. In the special case of zero time lag, autocorrelation is simply the average of the square of the signal, which is its variance. The cross and autocovariance functions are correlations corrected for the mean values of the signals, shown here without the flat hat over the R. For stationary processes, the autocovariance, like the autocorrelation, only depends on time lag tor, and for zero mean processes, the correlation and covariance functions are identical. Finally, the special case for zero time lag again reduces to the signal strength or variance, sigma squared. A vector can package up the individual signals that might be required to model something like an aircraft or vehicle position. The mean then becomes a vector of the individual signal means. But the correlation and covariance functions now involve multiplications of two vector signals, which results in a matrix. For example, this is the correlation function of a non-stationary process. The diagonal terms are the autocorrelations of the individual signals, and the off-diagonal terms are the cross-correlations between the different signals. It's worth noticing that owing to the symmetry around the diagonal, swapping the two time instances around is the same as performing a matrix transpose. Similarly, the covariance functions become matrices, and if the processes are zero mean, the covariance function is the same as the correlation function. Furthermore, if the time instants t1 and t2 are the same, that is with zero time shift, then all the terms become variances. This special case of the covariance function, often loosely known as the covariance matrix, labeled p here, is very useful as a measure of performance in filtering and prediction applications. The diagonal terms give the individual signal strengths, while the off-diagonal cross-correlations are zero if the signals are uncorrelated. For example, in a Kalman filter estimating a vehicle position, the trace of the error covariance matrix, adding up all its diagonal elements, is a measure of the total error in all of the components of the estimated position. Correlation and covariance are time domain measures that reflect the frequency content of a signal. The faster a signal can change, the shorter the time period over which the signal amplitudes are close in value to their neighbours, and the narrower its autocorrelation function. Power spectral density is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, 
measured in units like watts per hertz, and shows this information directly in terms of frequency. The area under the curve between any two frequencies being a measure of the average signal power in that band. I'll be talking mostly about Gaussian white noise. White noise, as for white light, refers to a signal with an equal combination of all frequencies. That is, a constant spectral density, or average strength, from DC through to infinite frequency, although it's often convenient to leave out the DC term. Gaussian refers to the fact that a sample value or amplitude at any instant is taken from a Gaussian or normal bell-shaped amplitude distribution, with most values being close to the mean, but the smaller going on infinitesimal probability of larger going on infinite amplitudes. With an infinite frequency range, the signal can change infinitely fast, and so the only thing it looks like is itself. As shown by its autocorrelation function, the inverse Fourier transform of the flat frequency spectrum being a Dirac pulse at zero lag. This idealized response is convenient for simplifying many calculations, but unfortunately the combination of an infinite frequency range and finite power per unit bandwidth adds up to infinite power. An infinite power adds up to infinite variance. These infinities make some of the other sums a bit tricky, and also make it necessary to characterize the size of a white noise signal by its strength rather than its variance. In practice, however, as well as in computer simulations, noise signals can't stretch to infinity in either frequency or amplitude. Band-limited white noise has a constant spectral amplitude over a large enough but finite bandwidth, achieved by passing white noise through an ideal filter with a maximum frequency FM, say. The autocorrelation becomes assigned something over something sync function rather than the Dirac pulse, but it narrows approaching the pulse as the bandwidth is increased towards infinity. Incidentally, as its autocorrelation is zero at multiples of 1 over 2 fm, then taking samples at the Nyquist rate of 2 fm samples per second should keep them uncorrelated. These MATLAB plots show a sample of band-limited white noise of unity variance now, rather than infinity, and its associated correlation and power spectral density functions. The autocorrelation still shows a simple spike at zero lag, because the cutoff frequency is much higher than the rest of the system, although the spike is not now infinitely tall, and is normalized to unity by the coefficient parameter in the MATLAB X-score correlation function. In finding the response of systems to noise, it turns out that mean values or offsets can often be treated deterministically. So we're mainly concerned with the strength of the noise output, as provided by the covariance matrix of signal variances. The system frequency response is given either by its power spectral density or by the related autocovariance or correlation functions. It's absolutely convenient to assume Gaussian white noise inputs, although the spectral factorization technique allows this to be stretched to a more practical case, and simulations are necessarily band-limited. You might like to take a look at the earlier videos in the sequence if you'd like some more background on this material. But now, let's move on to look at how transfer functions can be used to find how systems respond to white noise. The bad news is that while it's most convenient to assume our noise signals to be stationary, the response of a dynamic system to a stationary white noise input will not be stationary. So that it's misleading to try to take any statistic, even the mean say, by looking at the time series of any one sample. The better news is that if the system in question is stable, then the dynamics will eventually settle down to leave a steady state noisy output, which has stationary statistics. Starting with correlation, we can first use the convolution integral to find the output y of a system h to an input u in the usual way by adding up all of the individual impulse responses to every bit of the input. This can be plugged into the formula for the autocorrelation function of a stationary vector signal. Okay, if we are only looking for the steady state result. Winding up with this, 
where the second entry is time shifted by the time lag tor. The integrals can be pushed together here, and the matrix transpose rattle through the yt plus tor bit, swapping the h and u terms around. The expectation around everything only affects the stochastic input signal and can be slid inside the integrals. And using the variance of white noise as its strength multiplied by a direct function, firing when xi equals lambda gives this result. And since the integral of anything times a direct function is just the anything as its firing point, this takes out one of the integrations. Now, we can simplify this by substituting zeta for t minus lambda. And doing so makes the derivative negative and also changes around the limits for zeta. But swapping the limits back takes out the negative sign to give this. And finally, the upper limit can be extended to infinity to make the result into that for the steady state autocorrelation function. Fair enough, as that was the original assumption. And when the time lag tor is zero, this formula also gives the variance of the output. Taking a first order low pass filter as an example of applying these formulae, the inverse transform of 1 over s plus 1 gives an impulse response of e to the minus t valid for time greater than zero. Putting this impulse response into the formula for autocorrelation, along with the unity noise strength input, and taking the e to the minus tor out of the integral, and integrating the zeta term, gives this result. But the autocorrelation function is two-sided, and here we can use the matrix transpose trick to fill in the negative time half. And finally, at zero time shift, we get the variance of the output at 0 0.5. Moving on from autocorrelation to the mean value of the output by taking the expectation of the output, and moving the expectation inside the integral gives the result for the mean of the output. And if the input is zero mean noise, then the output response is also zero mean. Going back to the example used for the autocorrelation function, but this time assuming the input noise has an offset of 1 volt and that the output is initially 0, we have the e to the minus t impulse response and the expected value of the input is 1. Applying the formula, the impulse response shifted to e to the minus t minus lambda and unity input signal strength gives this. Taking out the e to the minus t term from the integration and integrating gives this result, which multiplies out as a charging exponential of unity time constant. Essentially, the input offset is acting like a deterministic signal driving the system dynamics. The actual mean result, however, only applies once the dynamic response has died away, beyond around 5 seconds or so here. Moving on to look at the frequency response of the output signal, we can find the power spectral density by taking the Fourier transform of the previous result for autocorrelation. Moving the integrals around, keeping the d tor and tor bits together, and now concentrating on just a square bracket for a moment, this can be tidied up by substituting lambda for xi plus tor, and then the e to the j omega xi bit can be pulled out of the integral. Exposing this integral as the Fourier transform of H transpose h transpose is a function of j omega. This result for the bracketed bit can then be replaced into the original integral, where now the first bit is the Fourier transform of h, but with negative frequency. Hence, the final result is that the frequency spectrum of a dynamic system with the transfer function h is h with negative frequency times the strength w of the input times h transpose. Notice though that w is the PSD of the white noise input and that the result of multiplying the minus j omegas by plus j omegas makes the PSD, the power spectral density, into a real function of a frequency, in fact a function of omega squared. And for scalar signals we can drop the transpose.
Returning to our first order filter example, substituting the transfer function, replacing the Laplace s by j omega, and the signal strength into the formula gives the resulting double-sided spectrum, emphasizing the low-pass filter action. So in summary, these are the formulae to find the mean, correlation function, variance and power spectral density of the system response to a white noise input signal, provided the system is stable and transients have died away to leave stationary output statistics. Spectral factorization is a method of generating non-white noise signals from white noise. It's useful because so far we've taken the easy option of looking at how systems respond to white noise, but in practice noise isn't often, if ever, white. But if measurements of a noise signal in question show that its spectrum can be approximated by a realizable transfer function, then the spectral factorization technique can be used to generate that signal. The aim is to create a suitable filter F to produce the actual noise N that drives the system from white noise, so that F can then be included within the dynamic model of the system and all of the previous results can be used. Applying the PSD formula for unity strength white noise shows the filter output to comprise F multiplied by its conjugate, so that to find F we need to factor S into the equivalent conjugate bits. This is the process, which assumes that the required PSD for the noise can be approximated by a function of omega squared, which can be factorized in the usual way into numerator and denominator terms, when the required filter poles and zeros are simply their corresponding square roots, from which a stable, realizable filter can be built. Taking an example spectrum with a PSD of 1 over 1 plus omega squared, the denominator factors into the conjugate pair of 1 plus or minus j omega. And now the required filter f could be chosen to be made from either half, but a practical stable implementation requires the 1 over 1 plus omega, or in Laplace terms, 1 over 1 plus s option. This slide shows the process for a more complex example from Friedland of the sort of noise generated by turbulent airflow. Again, there are positive and negative frequency bits, but the positive frequency half corresponding to the left-hand S-plane pole is the one needed to make a stable filter. This half, part 6a, has briefly introduced transfer function-based approaches to finding the mean, correlation and power spectral densities of the behaviour of dynamic systems driven by white noise inputs. In addition, the spectral factorization method enables the extension of these methods to non-white noise by bolting a suitable filter onto the system. Part 6b tackles state space methods, with an emphasis on the dreaded covariance matrix that characterizes the output signal strengths. Thank you.